Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Hey there. Welcome to ATL on 29, a Peachtree Hoops podcast where we look at the NBA from the starting point of Atlanta. My name is Kevin Chenard. I'm here with Glenn Willis of Peachtree Hoops. Uh, we're discussing things on Wednesday night. I guess it's Wednesday night where you are. It's Thursday morning where I am. Sure. And uh, this is after the Tuesday, Wednesday wins for the Hawks over Miami and Orlando in uh, the first two games of Nate McMillan's tenure, Uh, Nate's going to have a chance to pull off the rare Florida trifecta, getting his uh, first three wins with the team in Florida after the break when (laughs) the Hawks go to Tampa for a game with the Raptors. Uh, They're doing Florida bookends before and after the break. But, Glenn, uh, the Hawks outscored their two opponents 41-12 to in the last six minutes of both of those games. Uh, what do they need to do to just keep doing that every single game? Make, make shots in the fourth quarter. Don't, don't, don't. I think, honestly, the biggest thing to give a semi, at least a semi-serious answer is don't try to do too much in the fourth quarter. You know, it's, it's so easy and so hard at the same time to, to know whether any of that gets attributed to you know, the energy being any different with the coaching change and, you know, if any, a lot, of, a lot of teams will feel just kind of some pressure being relieved when there's, you know, when there has been maybe an imminent change there that took a while to, to happen or whatever, but the, you know, they look like just more relaxed for sure to me in the fourth quarter, not um, so much. And maybe tonight, I think maybe none, no turnovers where they were pressing and trying to make, you know, too big of a play or too perfect to play or like that. So I just, I, they just look relaxed, composed. They look like they're playing together a little more. Uh, even though Trey's still on the ball, like all the time. Um, there were times tonight, I thought where the ball moved better, even in the fourth quarter um, and, and stuff. So they just look more composed and maybe like a little bit of pressure has been lifted because the looming decision, maybe that, that everyone felt was just waiting to be, um, waiting to happen finally happened. So that's my best um, stab at it. Okay. And uh, I guess in both games, they kind of finished with quote unquote, one of their bigs, you know, they had sort of four shooters on the floor at least. Uh, and again, that's not really counting Collins as a shooter, but uh, can, you know, tonight they had Collins late with, with, you know, four good shooters. Last night it was Capella with, four wings. Uh, do you think that's going to be something that uh, continues Nate sort of going away from the Capella Collins lineups late? Well, I mean, he seems, even if you go back to the two games, he covered two games, I think, while LP was out with the birth. Of it wasn't it? Was it three? Two? Oh, maybe it was two. Three. Yeah, I think, I think Lloyd was supposed to be back ahead of the third one, but didn't quite clear in time. So yeah, maybe it was three. three. So yeah, he was, he was two and one. Win, I think. Yes, he's four and one now. I think if you combine combine those. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> um, but you know he rode solo over JC in Miami, and I I think he said after the game that he just had a unit that was playing well, and a lot of coaches will just uh, stick it, with it, even if it means you know leaving one of your better players on the bench there. Um, I find it a little funny. I, I understand why you said what you said, um, because Solo is more of a three probably. 
than a four, at least on this roster he is, the way it's constructed right now. Right. But John's obviously the superior shooter between the two. It's just yeah, that John, John has a different role, you know. Which and I, John's I less of a willing shooter, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, and John can do a lot more. Like, you're not going to see Solo set a screen and dive to the rim. There's no right. point, <laughs> no point in that. Um, it's but, more of a small look defensively. It is, and it gives you more – Solo gives you one more player that can defend on the ball in the middle of the floor. John, John's improved so much this year Yes, in terms of, like, a switch defender, but it's mm-hmm. really more on the edge and when he's able to call the switch, you know, from his kind of spot in the, that part of the scheme that they're executing. But so, Solo's not a great on-ball defender. Um, right. he's, but he's, he's a lot more aware on the perimeter off the ball than John is. He's an awesome um, help defender, awesome off the ball. Um, John's good, I think, coming to the help at the rim. Like right. like the play he made, made tonight at the end of the game was huge, you know. Yes. Um, if, I thought he forced uh, Ross to make a much tougher uh, shot attempt because of the way he came down and helped at the rim. Mm-hmm. But, it, but it is sort of like, do you want more rim presence on defense or more, or more you know, perimeter presence on defense? And with down being down Reddish and Hunter right now, you, they need as much unball and perimeter presence as, as they can get. So that, it, it kind of makes sense if you think about how much Miami uses the DHO to lift their shooters into perimeter shots and all that sort of stuff. So that made sense. But um, but th- then tonight it was kind of made simple because Capella didn't play. <laughs> and I, I was surprised that Gallo was on for that defensive position after Orlando called their last time out. I, w- I was very surprised too. Right. So I don't, I don't know – what did you expect to see instead of that? What is, what I mean, was it? I, I was very surprised. Like, literally, the <laughs> one of the last things Lloyd Peard said on his way out, you know, after the practice, uh, you know, hours before he was dismissed, was that, you know, teams will pick at things when they notice them. And teams have been picking on Gallo defensively for weeks now. And maybe they weren't expecting it, for one. You know, you kind of come out of a timeout they're probably expecting the Hawks to put someone else in so that the play they called, you know, maybe wasn't something to pick at that scab, so to speak. Right. Um, but boy, yeah, I was surprised by it. And uh, I think it caught Orlando off guard a little bit that, that they couldn't really go at him because they had already had their play at that point and they just kind of went with it. Yeah. But to be, to be, I guess to be kind of fair to capitalize on going at, um, a guy like Gallo, it requires you to have good ball handlers and guys who are used to being in that kind of creator role. And Orlando just doesn't really have any of those guys right now, you know. So if they, if they had, you know, like last year, DJ Augustine could have gotten them into something that would would have been a lot more likely to expose Gallo, you know, this year they've like, uh, how many point guards, <laughs> you know, have they lost? Um, so, you know, it Maybe that was maybe Nate calculated that. Maybe Nate was like, they don't have any ball handlers that's going to be able to, you know, in this situation, kind of steer the play towards a single defender because right. they really were playing without point guards, you know. So that's that could very. I mean, Nate's been head coach for 16 years, so yeah, I would not, I would not put it all past him to have fully baked that into his decision to put Gallo out there. Right. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Uh kind of going again to the late game stuff and with, you know, with Solomon Hill rolling last night, I think you pointed out an X's nose things that you said the Hawks were doing something different in the fourth quarter that they hadn't been doing before four flat. Yeah. That was, it's the first time I remember seeing it um, this year. And I, it, I think it's something I would have noticed had they run it before. I can't say for sure. I've seen every single possession um, of the season but if I've missed a few, it's like less than five. So, so yeah, it was, um, uh, I think there was like 30, 35 seconds left. The Hawks had the ball and basically they put all four of the uh, players on the court besides Trey all down on the baseline. Um, you see, I, I had mentioned, I think I meant shared on Twitter that this used to be the way that Brad Stevens closed games with IT when he was, you know, playing at an all-star level with that group, you know, the, the parallel they have there is IT's an undersized, you know, lead guard creator, you know, looking to score in that situation. 
that's uh, despite all of the wonderful passing skills and and how how many assists Trey you know racks up, he mostly looks to be a scorer when it gets into that that kind of situation. Right. Um, so I think there's a lot of parallels there, and it's interesting to me that these the very first game that that Nate coached and you know after um, they moved on from from Lloyd. That you saw, you saw that basically it was an exact replica of what Brad Stevens allowed IT to do to just kind of generate a possession that he felt comfortable comfortable about. Now, the difference for me is that IT always looked to kind of get to a step back around the free throw line. Maybe one dribble past the free throw line was kind of what he looked for. Um, and I think Trey is still looking to kind of get to the basket and get some contact, just like he did. I mean, tonight they didn't run four flat, but they they could have put Gallo on the baseline before they pulled him up for that screen on the play where Trey got to the free throw line. It was very right. similar. Um, but, it, you know, that's a great way. You know, the, the issue, primary issues Trey's had in the fourth quarter are turnovers, not being able to maybe read the whole play or the whole floor, and a really good way to make a point guard in that situation comfortable is put all four players on the baseline. It takes all four defenders down towards the baseline and it opens up a lot of space to start to play. It it opens up a lot of space for Trey to start that attack basically wherever he wants because everybody else is pressed down on the baseline and he doesn't have to look right or left. If you, if you have Herter like in the right corner and say Snell in the left corner, Trey's got to look in both directions and see if a defender is coming from that corner you push everybody down the baseline and Trey really doesn't have to worry about that. He can just kind of focus on what spot he wants to get to. He can decide if he wants to call a player up for a screen against Miami. He called Snell up for the screen tonight. It looked like they had kind of um, already decided that Gallo was going to be the, that screener, but the, he looked comfortable with that. So I, I, you know, it'll be watching basketball the way that I do. I'll be fascinated if that becomes their fourth quarter go-to as a way to, you know, eliminate all of this kind of potential traffic and all of these um, kind of variables that Trey has to track around him, push push everyone down on the baseline, create all that space, let Trey decide where he wants to go, let Trey decide if he wants to get a screen from somebody and let him go to work. I think it's uh, a really interesting and so far it's been a really effective thing to do. So when they do that, how do those other four offensive players do whatever it is they need to do to keep their defenders engaged so that nobody kind of cheats away from the baseline. Yeah. I mean, that can happen, but basically if someone cheats away from the baseline, you hope that someone kind of slips to the rim and either draws a defender, either goes to the rim and contests it or, or um, pulls a defender that opens up someone in the corner and you kind of live with that. Mm -hmm. Um, If you could, if we could go back like three years, some of the best, um, similar action I saw was then when Reggie Jackson had his the one really good year he had under Stan uh, okay. up in Detroit. They'd run right. that a lot, yeah, a ton. Um, and but uh, but you know the idea is that that late teams defenses aren't going to risk opening up the rim like that, right? Um, and so, but there there is specific action that has to happen once, like in this case, once Trey starts to dribble toward the paint. Mm-hmm. Usually, the the side he's on, someone has to lift up toward the three point break, and the other person has to push out to the corner. And then on the weak side, you see a little bit similar action, just not so much. You see one person on the baseline just outside the paint, and the other person kind of moving up towards the th- the break. So the the timing is still. There's still nuance and timing that has to happen there. Right. I think the biggest thing is that it, it allows Trey to see everybody and to see basically the whole court and not worry about any second defender coming from his left or right and kind of impacting how he wants to get that play started. But there's nuance, there's timing. Um, but I would, I, th- I think when you have like Gallo and Snell and now that Donovich is back, you have guys who've run a lot of that. Maybe – Hunter hasn't because they haven't run that in Atlanta and Reddish hasn't. But if you have, you know, mostly your, your veterans on at the end of the, end of the game like that, I, th- I think that they know how to handle themselves through that nuance. Gallo does, Snell does, Bogdanovich does, Solo does, um, you know, and, and Capello the, the, before um, D'Antoni kind of really went away from using a center at all. Yeah, I'm sure Capello got a good bit of that in Houston too. But yeah, it's, it's, you know, I was anxious to see what would be different, and I was shocked to see the old 
you know, watching Trey do it, like I said, it elicits so much of my recollection of seeing IT do that with Brad Stevens in Boston and it being so effective to clear out space for a small guard. Uh, just to come full circle here to give you your fair opportunity since you've been on a lot, but you weren't. Uh, this is the first time we've talked since uh, Lloyd Pierce was dismissed. Uh, you know, having sort of had a couple days to digest, what are your thoughts on anything that you want to discuss related to that? <laughs> well, I mean, you go a uh, lot of ways with this one. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I think everyone knows I'm disappointed, and it, and I, I, you know, I didn't want to go do like a you know, a 15 tweet thread on Twitter or anything like that. But, uh, you know, I did just try to put my thoughts out there to make it clear after it happened sort of where my head is. And, you know, I've said all along that, you know, I don't, I don't know that anyone can say they've seen from him enough to know that, hey, this is going to be, you know, our head coach for the next three or four years to get another contract, you know, may, maybe not even, um, and probably, I should say, probably not even seen enough to say, he should have his option for what would have been next year picked up. Um, I think that he, he, to me, he showed enough growth in how many things he's able to throw at his team and, and, and kind of at the beginning of this year, they were executing a good amount of it pretty well. Um, that effectiveness um, waxed and waned and, and was absent for too long for them to kind of hit their targets for the season. Um, but I just think he deserved, and, and not just him, but I think any coach deserves more opportunity than I feel like he got. So that's just to be clear. I just think that they didn't really put functional rosters together the last two years. This year, he didn't really have his roster at all, no preseason, um, to kind of get nine new guys mixed in. That's People have heard that from me. So I'm still disappointed that that was the outcome. But I'm also just not surprised. And I'm also not surprised to see the team maybe have a little bit of uh, you know, more pep in their step, if you will, um, and things like that, just because that's just kind of how sports works is um, when it feels like something's about to happen, it's almost like that thing has to happen before anyone can kind of move on and really think about anything else. Um, Nate McMillan is a interesting fit for Trey. You know, he hasn't always run the most modern offensive systems. He hasn't always valued the three-point shot. Um, it's it's weird for me because he's a from the George Carl tree, and George Carl was an offensive innovator. But over the 16 years Nate had, in you know, as a head coach, he became more and more and more of a defensive coach and kind of just relied on his best one or two offensive players to kind of create shots however they – mostly however they wanted to. So, you know, I – I hope, uh, you know, Lloyd gets another shot at some point in time, if that's what he wants. I will remain disappointed. Um, I hope they do well. I I don't see the, how this change really addresses any of what I saw being kind of their bigger issues. So that's sort of my whole punch list of, of reaction <laughs> there, which most people have probably heard at least but the pieces of it before. Yeah, it's interesting. I I can't remember even what I said to Wes two days ago, but it just doesn't seem like there are all that many head coaches who go through the bottoming out and get to see their teams all the way through the, the uprise right. that, that follows. And, you know, it kind of dovetails with what you were saying is that the last two years of rosters were not good. And so now you, yeah, you've got the pandemic year with pandemic practice time and pandemic preseason and then injuries. And, you know, that makes it hard and you still can't, somehow you can't take away those first two years. I mean, we can say, well, the rosters are bad, but things happen and emotions build up and people get into bad ruts and bad habits. And for sure. And, you know, it, yeah, it, you went through those two years together and whatever bad things built up over those two years, uh, it's still there even when you're trying to give that coach a, a fair shot in his third season. Yeah, ag agreed. And, and I think I think any coach, even a brand new head coach, knows going into a rebuild, that's just part of the risk calculation is that 
there's going to be a lot of losing early just because of how rebuilds work and that you may or may not. And if you kind of look at recent history, you're not very likely to kind of be still in that role when the team gets quite good. You know, like Brett Brown was a bit of an exception there in terms of he got it like I think two decent shots, you know, to coach playoff teams before he was let go yeah. um, last year. Um, you if you wonder how close like the Jazz might have gotten when they after Gordon Hayward left, um, you know, with Quinn, if, if they felt like, well, has our team kind of uh, peaked? And do we need a different voice, as you hear a lot of people say, to kind of come in and try to get us to another level? I I tend to value continuity. I, it, I'll be honest and say that a lot of that probably comes from my experience working in the corporate world and building teams and building leadership teams. I just having learned how, like, how much continuity really matters to results and performance. Right. Don't know. That, I don't know that. It, I mean, if someone said, Glenn, that doesn't necessarily translate to sports, uh, true. <laughs> that could be, that could be true. But I just think, and that, but, you know, it pop, I think Pop talked about continuity being a key. And I also believe in when you have good people in important roles, giving them an opportunity to grow in that role towards being the, the performer and the leader that's needed for that role. And, and that, that there's, there's a need to, when, when possible and as much possible allow room for growth and learning and improving. You know, I know a lot of people are like, well, head coach of a sport, professional sports team. We don't want someone learning on the job, but that's just how it works. If you're going to give someone their first head coaching job is, you know, you kind of buy in, in my mind, you buy into giving them an opportunity to grow in the role. And um, I would say that I've, I wouldn't say again, that Lloyd showed so much that he deserves no doubt another three years, two years, and like I said, probably needed the rest of the year before I'd even say he deserved getting picked up for next year. But I, I just, I fall on the side of saying, I, I just think he deserved, deserved a lot more opportunity. But I also know in sports, the head coach is accountable for results and the results were where um, Tony Wrestler probably wanted them. And if we listen to Travis's words, they were where Travis wanted to see them right now. We have to, I think, to a certain extent, just take Travis at his word there. Grow in your role. That all sounds way too ambitious. I'm trying to diminish in my role. Down. I'm trying to downscale. I just want to get by. <laughs> There's that can be a very effective strategy. I don't know. I don't know that it's one to stay in a pro, head coaching position of a professional sports team, though. So <laughs> I, I'm sure we could come up with a few examples there of people who've done that. Be, maybe a little bit too mean for your brand. Wow. <laughs> But, uh, you know, that's yeah, just a, that's probably more of a, a college head coach that's been around for a long, long, long time, probably. But, but uh, you know, to probably the one thing I haven't thrown out there, um, yeah, and I haven't written about it at Peace Review, so I haven't thrown this out there on Twitter because it's Twitter's just a terrible place to try to throw a nuanced view out there shouts to Brad Roland. <laughs> uh quote or no, they, they, no, no everybody that does this on my podcast gets chad never never no shouts for brad ever okay, okay. well I, I i just was concerned that maybe he'd already trademarked trademarked nuance is dead and just didn't want to get you any legal trouble oh, okay. but no the, the thing for me is like what what this and i should i should share before i get into this that if you want to hear a longer conversation about a month ago i went on dane moore's uh, podcast. He's a, one of my best friends. Um, he covers the Timberwolves, and we talked about kind of the parallels of the Wolves and the Hawks. And I looked at it, the Wolves more as a cautionary tale that if you have a lot of resets at the in the front office of the head coach, you know things like that, that it really can affect your ability to determine what you really have in a young core. Um, and you know, with all the the reinventions that the Wolves went through. You know, I think there was some impact there to figure out can Cat and Wiggins play together? Could, you know, Levine have worked with them uh, if you're constantly resetting? So this is one one change, you know, so I don't want to be overly dramatic about it. 
But if, you know, now Travis is on the hot seat, well, what does that mean? If, you know, if there's a new leader of the front office next year or two years from now, and we have a coach that's been in role for a year, a year and a half or whatever, and that person wants to bring in, quote, his person, you know, that's just a slippery slope for me. And I think that Hawks fans can look at what the Wolves have gone through with all of those, what I call resets, and just say that's that's not the path that we hope the team goes down. Now, for me, um, probably one of my, I don't know if I call it a concern. I, I, if I'm really honest, I'd say I'm probably a, a bit concerned, but more curious about is what does this do for Trey sees himself, the way Trey sees himself as a coachable player, and the way Trey sees himself is how much, um, I don't know if I want to use the word power, but how much maybe collateral he has being the young superstar and the foundational player on the team. I think it's really hard for any 22-year-old player in his third year to get his head around. That's what Trey is. That's the role he's in. That's the position he's earned. Uh, and, and I don't intend to diminish that at all. But I think that there's a certain um, kind of way to think about will this help Trey kind of grow towards, you know, further becoming the person that, you know, I, I think a player like him needs to be as a, as a leader, if I could use that term, as the best player that everyone's relying on and all that sort of stuff. I have no idea what the relationship between Lloyd and Trey was, honestly. I know there's been a ton of chatter, but I don't know what's true and what's not true. So I'm not really going to worry about that anymore because that chapter is closed. Um, but what I am curious about is how a year from now we look at this and how we maybe see some for more growth in Trey. And maybe we see a partnership that Trey just feels better about for whatever reason that he did with Lloyd. So, you know, I view this as being, I, I think I said on Twitter, we're like 15% within the process of finding out if the Hawks actually made this better or not. And it'd be a part, big part of it is that that is, is your next coach going to be a good head coach? Is he going to be someone that Trey feels good about? It is important for Trey to feel good about the partnership he has with his head coach. So there's there's a lot left to be decided. There's a lot left to be transacted. And a lot of that for me is how this plays into Trey seeing his own individual growth trajectory and his role on this team and him buying further into that, him buying um, continuously into that and that becoming a better situation for him and the team. That's that's kind of the most interesting thing I'm watching going forward from this point, if that makes sense. I know I asked you last time about Tony Snell, but I kind of want to bring him up again, almost as part of a larger idea. And I'm, I know last time I think the question was, you know, if it's a play in game and it's sort of, winner take all, you know, how much, how much does Tony Snell play? I, I kind of want to do the same thing again, but in a different context and, and kind of tied into what you were just saying. You know, I asked Trey after the game tonight, I asked him, uh, you know, if he'd ever played with somebody who was shooting as well as Tony Snell <laughs> has shot over the last month and a half. And I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to be sustainable, but there's something to it. You know, we, we mentioned the last two years, the rosters being very young. And, you know, if, if the players on the last couple of rosters weren't very young, they were either not very good or uh, extremely old sort of veterans of council. You know, Ray, Trey's dad, after tonight's game, t tweeted that, you know, he, he was proud of Trey's pass on the shot that put the Hawks ahead for, put the Hawks ahead after the comeback. It was like a, it was a, it was a three to Tony Snell in the corner and kind of in transition or semi-transition. They pushed the ball a little bit. Trey kind of had the defense lurching because, you know, he'd gotten across half court and nobody was really on him yet. So you see a, more than one body kind of like, oh, shit, we got to get to Trey. And that kind of pulled up the defense, and Trey just kind of – it was – you know, Trey's so good at the hit-ahead passes. This was more of a delayed hit-ahead pass, but he got he got it to Snell in the corner. Snell got a very good look from for a corner three and hit it. You know, Ray was treating that, tweeting that he was uh, proud of Trey for that pass. Trey quote-tweeted that tweet and said something like, well, 
T. Snell doesn't miss. And, and I bring mm-hmm. it up in this sense. How do you strike the right balance between having sort of trusted veterans who already kind of know what they are and what they're supposed to do and are doing it versus young players who are trying to figure it out. And for, for somebody like Trey, who's trying to orchestrate and put it all together, it, it's pretty striking the difference between sort of having trust in a mid career uh, player in his prime, like Snell versus somebody young, like Cam Reddish. I mean, I just don't think, he might not make that same pass if that's reddish in that situation. Like there's just a different level of trust there. And how do you strike that balance? And, and, you know, once everybody on this version of the roster is healthy, how do you go about putting enough players out there that, that Trey trusts versus trying to develop, uh, you know, the guys on the roster who are really young? That's yeah. a good question. No, it's a no. It's a great question. There's a lot of there's a lot of nuance in the question that's important. Um, for me, you know, I think there is some temptation to want to say let's let's make this work with Hunter and Reddish and and Collins and you know the kind of the young core. You know, maybe Herder. Um, I I love her to be Herder. Um, if Herder's playing um, at that level, to warrant that as well. But there's no doubt that Trey is the most important thing here in terms of the team building um, and building his confidence as a playmaker in crunch time is critical. And, and for right now, especially, if what's going to help him maximize you know, his ability to function with confidence at that point is to put veterans out there in those final three or four minutes I think that's the right thing to do. Um, you hope that over time that when with like, say a camera, I, I mean, first of all, I have to say you know, Hunter is pretty savvy, you know, second year player. So I would, He's I would hope. Yeah. I'm yeah. not even counting him in this. Discussion. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to be clear because people are right like now. young guys, like guys who still play young, like Cam still plays young. Uh, right. You have to play really young. Bruno Super young. Yeah. plays young. Um, Kevin's right. trying to figure out his way defensively, and Cam's trying to figure out his way offensively. I, I don't know. And and, Kev, and, and her, Kevin is also a, kind of in second gear, sometimes third gear, sometimes fourth gear, even offensively. He's looked like he's been a little more aggressive these last two games, and maybe that's related to the coaching change too, or maybe that's related to something Trey's doing a little differently because he feels better about things maybe. Um, but, you know, I think the thing that I see for Trey that, that that works well, especially for where he is right now, is he doesn't, once he starts to attack, he doesn't want everybody moving. You know, he's such a good passer. He doesn't need much of a passing lane at all. That if you kind of just stay put, or if you need to move to disadvantage a defender that's left you as a shooter to kind of help down towards the paint, to only move as much as necessary. And I think right. and the predictable can, movements like lifting right. from the corner and stuff that just, you know, exactly. old hat. Exactly. And if you only need to lift one step or a step and a half, just the, that step, step and a half, which creates a more static passing lane that Trey can just kind of, you know, nail. And instead of being on the move, with, you know, let's say Trey kind of gets, you know, a step past the free throw line, he's maybe not yet decided if he's looking at a floater opportunity versus, you know, still reading a defender coming from the corner to kind of help down on him. Late movement drives him crazy. And I think even like a lot of veteran, you know, guys, it, it does too. And that's what Cam does a lot. Cam will take off and crash the paint uh, at times just, on instinct and it's not really a read it doesn't look like to me anyway and what if you kind of go back and even watch the play tonight that um was that you know ray was pointing out and and all that is you know snell had movement but it was such subtle movement and it was only the movement that was necessary and he created a really you know, reliable target for Trey to hit there. That's something Cam's not doing at all right now, even as John is now put in the corner more to the last 10, 12 games or so than he even was the first, you know, 20 some or games of the season. John's lifting with some weird timing at times and lifting too high and too erratically. 
Um, and that's where Bogdanovich, you know, he knows how to sit there and then move and only move as much as necessary. Snell's the same way. Gallo, when he's in that corner instead of JC, he's the same way. And that to me is what Trey needs right now in crunch time is guys that he can rely on to stay put, move as much as necessary, move with the right timing, don't do something crazy like try to crash the paint and follow a help defender <laughs> into the paint when you've been left in the corner. And that's, that's what Trey has been in for the last two years. And when you try to close with a super young lineup, in a lot of cases this year, because there's been so many vets hurt, um, that's what Trey's been dealing with as well. And, you know, everybody's talked about Trey's numbers and crunch time and stuff. I don't want to say this explains all of it, you know, that can't be true. You know, his decision-making hasn't been good. But I think that, like I said, to kind of start this answer, Trey's the most important part and getting him built up to, you know, from a confidence perspective and from a standpoint of him be able to kind of be in a, in a situation where he feels like he can control the possession is more important than how Cam Reddish might, how Cam Reddish's development might or might not be impacted in a situation like that. So that hopefully that's an answer you're somewhat somewhere in the ballpark of what you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. You have other thoughts on that? You see it differently? I'm always curious to get your, your view. No, that, that's, that sounds about right. It's intriguing. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's what I'm, when I come from back from the break, that's really what I'm watching the most, most closely the first five to 10 games is. Trey being put into situations and him looking more confident, playing more confidently, um, and seeing you know lineups turn out in the games that that deliver on that for him, and then maybe you know, you know the some of the younger guys earn their way into some of those opportunities as the season goes on. But I don't think there's any way to get around the fact that Trey's the most important thing. There were two plays tonight that really cracked me up. Just. Hilarious. One was Orlando kind of pushing the ball. MCW gets it across half court. He has Vucevic behind him. And he just tries to do like a, a dump behind, just kind of doesn't even look, just bounces it, and he just gave it to Trey. Trey's like, what? Oh, okay, well, thank you. <laughs> the other one was Kevin Herter and Gallinari were doing a pick and pop. And I don't know why it cracked me up so much, but I think, you know, they ran a little pick and pop. Kev passed it. And Gallinari is so slow that he got to maybe about halfway to where Kev put the ball. <laughs> <laughs> I remember this. It's like, Kev, Kev you got to keep it a little closer. He's, he's not Cam. He's not John. You, 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 you got you to gotta play it a little tighter with the pass there. He's he's not going to get to where some of your other teammates get. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, and you even see Trey, you know, kind of miss some timing on that too. Yeah, for sure. I, I think it I think it works great, especially with Trey, like in the pick and pop. But it's when Gallo is in whatever his version of a sprint is. <laughs> it's like, do I time him on how fast he's moving right now? How I'll be use air quotes, how fast he's moving right now, or do I count for how awkward his stopping is going to be? Because I don't think Gallo even is like, he's like a toddler running around inside to stop. And it's like, is it going to be on the dime or one step or two steps, or is he going to fall down? You know, it's hitting Gallo as a moving target is uh, I think tough for anybody right now, but when they win, yeah, it's like, easier to look like a big defensive it. play though. Like the one where he, he blocked it off. He got a block at the rim, but also it was just a deflection. So he just kind of knocked on the magic player going out of bound, knocked it off the shooter. Yeah, uh, He's got really long arms, which I think, you know, if he didn't have that, he'd be really lost because the Hawks count on that a lot of times just for offense. It's like, well, six seconds left in the clock. What are we going to run here? And it's just kind of you give the ball to Gallo. Uh, you always get a little nervous when – he looks like he's going to try to make a dribble play out of it. I mean, really, his his number one option there is to just kind of use his height and use his incredible reach and his high release. And it's just like, <laughs> I'm going to put it up here and nobody's really going to get it. They, they get a lot of shots that way. Uh, somehow it, it it feels, you know, the, those late those late clock shots are never terribly efficient, but it, it feels kind of efficient 
you know, if, if you get to that point, which you probably don't want to, uh, it, it feels better than average for the situation when he has it in those moments. Yeah, I, I might be the only person that sees it this way, but he reminds me so much of Marco Bellinelli, Marco when he played with the Hawks. Mm-hmm. Um, but the difference is, like, in those situations, if Marco got the ball, even with, like, three seconds on the shot clock, he was thrilled to get the ball <laughs> and thrilled to have an opportunity <laughs> to shoot it and look just confident all the time, like, yeah, I got this. Um, with Gallo, it looks more to me like he gets the ball and he's like, oh, well, I guess I'm going to have to create a shot here. <laughs> and it's like the, just the energy that in the, if I can use the word emotion that's conveyed is hilarious because Marco was like always thrilled to have any reason to have it and shoot the basketball <laughs> where Gallo was like, oh, shucks, I guess I have to create a shot here. I'm as good as anybody else in this situation that we have on the court right now. Fair enough. Uh, is there anything else you want to hit on before we exit? I think the last thing for tonight, we'll just hit on real quickly, is you kind of started on it in your comments, what um, brought it to mind. Gallo was important defensively in the fourth quarter in that he was matching up with Vooch and Collins had five fouls forever. Um, Collins doesn't make that last play on um, Dross to force the tough shot. And then Collins, you know, ends up being the guy that's fouled and hits those, hit those two free throws. So, um, you know, Gallo does, does get picked on a lot, but when the team is kind of functional as a defensive lineup, um, he's he's done some good work defensively this year. And I think it's just important to point that out. And, um, you know, he, he did a nice job in the fourth quarter, kind of, kind of keeping Gallo away from the free throw line. It was a lot of subtle stuff he was doing. But you notice, like one of got one of sorry one of Vuce's late shots was from the corner, and he wasn't getting all of those shots in the, at, at the free throw line in his final um, stretch of play when once he entered the game for the last time. So you know, we can have always have fun with Gallo. There's no end to the number of ways to have fun with Gallo. But I think it's well, I, I would have uh, felt bad if I didn't point out how important he was defensively tonight. Yeah. So yeah, he he was good down the stretch. He gave them. Uh... He gave them what they needed there in that respect, for sure. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I'm sure he's. I'm sure he's ready for the break. Hope you're ready for the break. I'm ready for a break. I'm ready uh, for a long break. There aren't going to be any podcasts for a few days. I can guarantee that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. I'm looking forward to the break too. <laughs> Wait, you're you're not local, but what do you think of the Brook uh, Brookhaven City Council extending the pour time for bars and restaurants to 4 a.m. for All Star Weekend in a pandemic? <laughs> Uh, not in favor. I, <laughs> I haven't uh, left my house in 12 months, Glenn. I don't want to die. Uh, yeah, I know. And, and it feels like the vaccine is, if, if, the, if for those of us who haven't had it yet, it feels like it's right around the corner. It's like, can we just hold this together a little longer, please? That's, that's the way I look at it anyway. Yeah. All right. On that right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, four and one under, four and one under Nate. Four and one under Nate, uh, a nice two nice fourth quarter performances. Uh, I th- I think that's a nice way to send Hawks fans into the break. So I, I think we can end on that note. I hope. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Kevin.